Well, good morning, Medina First Baptist Church, and welcome to our abnormal new more normal for the next few weeks, maybe even the next month or so. We don't really know yet. I am I am excited about being with you. I'm thankful for the opportunity we have to share together today. Um, I'm actually in this mysterious room that you may have passed by on your way to worship from time to time, but you've probably never ventured in to see what was actually in that room. And this is actually our church library. It's a project that's been many, many years in the making. In fact, one of the books I just found on the shelf is a book made for such a time as this. It's called Phonology, P-H-U-N-O-L-O-G-Y, A Thousand Games and Entertainment Plans. Um, if you're running out of things to do at home, you might want to run up here and grab this book out of the library pretty soon. All jokes aside, we are in uncharted territory, aren't we? Most of us are very unfamiliar with what to do. In fact, in, in our lifetime, we've had nothing in the backdrop of human society that would lead us to a time like we're experiencing right now. So this morning, I simply want to lead you through a time of reflection of life and in light of the Word of God and what the Word of God would have to say to us in the midst of times like this, where, where we are all affected and we all experience the the disruption to our daily schedules, the disruption to our lives, the anxiety that's being produced and all the things going around. However, this morning, I assure you, if you're sitting on your couch in a recliner, at the kitchen table, wherever you might be watching this video, I can assure you I've taken on all the awkwardness for you because you guys know this is not my norm, but we're going to work through this together anyways. So I'm glad you're tuning in. I'm glad you're taking a few moments to, to study the Word with me. And let's just dive right in. I wanted to begin by asking you if there are certain truths that, that seem most important to you today, or is there a certain reality to which you're clinging? Is there a certain desire of your heart that you would value more than all the others? I think today one of the things we're finding is that we all long for comfort. Comfort, the idea of security, a place of belonging, a place of safety. In Isaiah chapter 12, the, the prophet is beginning to shift themes. And one of the major theological shifts in the book of Isaiah takes place in chapter 12. In Isaiah chapter 12, it says, You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. For with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known, and all the earth shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. You might not sound, feel like singing and shouting for joy today. In fact, your home may, may be one of those that's, that's most quarantined. You've, you've pulled yourself away, and rightly so, and, and according to the, the direction you feel the Lord has led you at this point. But in the midst of crisis, in the midst of, of difficulty, in the midst of the times in which we're facing, how do we respond? What do we do? There has been one recurring theme in conversations I've had over the last week, and it's the theme of concern, of weight. We might even call it worry. We have no backdrop to process something like COVID-19. In our lifetimes, there have been assassinations. There have been wars. There have been tremendous moments of political and social tension. Many of us watching this, this video today vividly remember the scenario that played out before our eyes on September 11th, 2001. But a, but a moment where death may be looming in a, in, a, in a situation where there seems to be no end, we simply don't have that backdrop against which to process these things. 
And right now, everybody's offering their expertise. Everyone seems to want to offer their take and, and their perspective. But perhaps it would do us a good deal to grab a dose of humility and recognize we're all in this together. Every one of us is facing many of the same trials, many of the same concerns, many of the same situations. But this isn't historically the case. The Black Death you might have heard it called the Great Bubonic Plague, ravaged Europe and Asia. It, it, for about 330 years, it was to be found, in, in, to some degree or another, in Europe. The presence of the Black Death is, is maybe one of those moments in history class that, that we have to be reminded of. It, it, was, it could even be considered the, the deadliest pandemic in human history. This particular pandemic served as the backdrop for a, a catechism, a, a biblical teaching, a church way of, of discipling their people that, that was formed in the, in the 16th century, in 1560s. In 1563, there was a catechism produced called the Heidelberg Catechism. We've referenced some of those catechisms and, and some other teaching models and uh, historic confessions of the faith in the past. But the Heidelberg Catechism of 1563, in the first question, it simply asks this question, what is your only comfort in life and death? Comfort. You see, against the backdrop of the, of, of the Black Death, the bubonic plague, there was, there was great uncertainty. There were stories of people who would who would take those who had not yet died, who were nearly dead or, or, or facing imminent death, and they would be discarded out of fear for the death that could be brought to the rest of a home, a neighborhood, a city. It was a time when life was seen as cheap, and everyone went into a self-preservation mode. It was a time that, that men would, would refer back to the most barbaric of instincts. And it was a time when the Christian church shined most brightly. You see, the, back, the backdrop of the Heidelberg Catechism is certainly certain, uh, there, there are certainly many religious debates, movements, developments going on. We are, by the time this catechism is written, the Protestant Reformation is in full swing. But always looming in the background are the reports and the experiences of a cataclysmic event that had swept across an entire continent. An event that brought great death and suffering. And so the picture was painted in, in the eyes of the people very well and and the question had to be answered, what is your comfort in the midst of the situation? And the comfort the people of God would proclaim was the answer to that first great question. What is your only hope, your only comfort in life and in death? The answer begins that I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, for he has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. What is your comfort? Medina First Baptist Church, our comfort rests in the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah chapter 12, that in that day we will together be able to sing and give thanks to the Lord for though he was angry with me, his anger turned from us that he might comfort us. For behold, God is our salvation and we may trust and not be afraid. For he is our strength and our song and he become 
our salvation. This great truth is, is as a salve to your soul. Spurgeon often referred to that which believers carried with them as the balm of Gilead. This, this cleansing, this healing balm, this ointment for the most difficult of situations, this healing, this ointment, this medicine for the most disquieted of souls. This morning, wherever you are watching this video, however you are processing the events around you, the reality is we're all in this together. We understand that these are the things we're, to, we're supposed to know and to experience as believers. We understand that as believers, we are to delight ourselves in God. But, but how do we do that? How do we know this? How do we obey the teachings of Christ in Matthew chapter 6? In the Sermon on the Mount, when, when he says that we're not to worry. He cautions us to consider all the, the creative elements that are present among us. Sparrows that are sold two for a penny in the market, and yet not one falls to the ground without God knowing. And Jesus tells us in Matthew 10 that if God so cares for the sparrow, then does He not care that much more for you? How much more valuable are you than, than a couple of sparrows? And in Matthew 6, He gives us the instruction. In Matthew chapter 6, in verse 25, we find a couple of things that Jesus instructs the church with. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious or worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? But look at the birds. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet our Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed, was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear for the Gentiles? Seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them all. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Anxiety. Worry. Three different times in, in this passage, Jesus commands that we are to, to repent, to turn away from, to even avoid worry. In fact, one, one scholar I've even encountered this week as, as pastor scholars, he was preaching on this text and using this text to instruct the body of Christ. He, he reminded the church that, that three times this particular word changes its tense, it changes its form. And, and in the change, it is intentional that, that there are th it is as if there are three unique commands here. One is to stop worrying. Two is to not begin worrying. Three says just simply don't worry. And each of these affecting each one of us at different points in different ways, but still the fact remains that Jesus points us back to the sovereign, unfailing, loving arms of our Father. The fact that this God who is our salvation, this God who has bought and paid for us with a price, this is the very one true and living God who has loved our souls. So against the backdrop of the black death, true and faithful believers were able to declare, my only comfort in life and death is not the emperor. It's not Caesar. It's not a local magistrate. No, it is that I am not my own, but, with, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. 
O oh, fellow believers, we have been bought and paid for with a price. We do not own ourselves. And today we belong to the one who sits enthroned on high, the one who bears the name that is above every name, the one in whose name we find hope and salvation. We belong to Jesus. Why? Because He paid for all your sins with His precious blood and set you free. Free from the tyranny of death, from the tyranny of sin, from the tyranny of hopelessness. There may be very little any of us can do in light of COVID-19 and coronavirus. It certainly seems as though we are pretty helpless at this point. But this tyranny, the fear of death, the fear of, of life that is, that is tethered by finite realities is a fear that's been broken because Jesus has conquered death and the grave for you. In Christ, we know we are not our own. We belong to Him because of what He's done for us. This is the, the promise of 2 Corinthians 5.21 that He made Him to be sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. And this same Jesus who saved you and set you free for eternity promises to preserve you. He promises to, to, to move in your life even in such a way that without the will of our Heavenly Father not even a hair can fall from your head. That's the promise and the teaching of Christ in Matthew 10. Therefore, we can trust that all things then must work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. This is a promise many of us have, have likely shared with ourselves over the last week or so. That that in light of all that could happen in, in, in our lives, in light of all the realities that we face, that God works all things together for our good, for our eternal good, for our salvific good. And He's given us the seal of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit to assure us of our eternal life, to, to make us ready and willing to live for Him. So how do we live for Him in a time of crisis? As I shared with you earlier this week, Medina First Baptist Church and all churches exist for the glory of God. And our primary way that we glorify God is to proclaim the saving knowledge of Jesus to the ends of the earth and together to work and to strive with one another to live under the Lordship of Jesus, our Savior. And then I challenge you, Medina First Baptist Church, to, to live then with, the, with a heart of love. Love for one another. Love for the outside world. Love for, for our Heavenly Father. These are our great affections that drive us. And so how does this work its way out? Again, let's turn to the pages of history. One of the Protestant reformers, Lord Zwingli, was on vacation in the early 1600s, 1500s. He came back. The Black Death had finally made it to his, to his town, to his place, to his country. He came back from vacation and rather than fleeing as was the habit of most, he employed himself in the caring for the people around him. One writer said that Zwingli's hope in heaven did not make him reckless or selfish in the face of sickness and death, but it filled him with courage and unleashed him to see and seek to meet the needs of others. For he knew what was at stake and what was waiting for him on the other side of death if he, he accepted the danger at enormous risk to himself to care for the suffering, especially those destined for eternal suffering. Brothers and sisters, this is not a time for the church to shrink back. 
Yes, we are not meeting. I was in the sanctuary earlier. And it grieved me. To think about the fact that we are separated. I was sharing with Brother Jonas a few moments ago that, that walking into an empty sanctuary, recognizing that we would not be meeting together in this room, caused me to, to lament to long for that nearness of that fellowship. And yet we recognize that by God's good grace and His pleasure, we're actually able to fellowship in this way. We're able to communicate and, and to continue to walk and to serve one another well. We're not shrinking back. We're not taking unnecessary risks. But understanding that God has called us to something greater, here's what we know we can do. We can love courageously. We can love obediently. We can love with a sense of, of self-sacrifice in the face of anything this world has to offer. Medina First Baptist Church, other friends and family, know this, that this is a time for each of us to remain open to those around us, to love on people in need, to protect those who are without protection, to encourage all to look to the crucified one, the one who died, was buried and rose again, that we might have victory and hope in the midst of calamity. God, our Father, our King, is able to save to the uttermost. He's able to save at the last moment. He's able to save in every moment. So brothers and sisters, walk confidently in the midst of a crisis. Shout for joy over the salvation of your soul. Sing with Isaiah. In the midst of the declaration, let us sing praises to the Lord, for He has done gloriously. Maybe at such a time as this, that God is allowed to rise up to perhaps remind us of some of the blessings that are ours in Christ, to cause us to long more heartily for those moments. Maybe it's to remind us of first principles a first order kinds of things. That the God who saves you is the God who loves you, is the God who will see you through, is the God who one day will ultimately deliver you from this body of decay and corruptibility into life immortal and corruptible, eternal with Him. Maybe one day I'll get comfortable sharing with you over a camera. Boy, I hope not. I hope we're not, we're not this far apart for this much longer. But as long as we are, let us continue to be reminded of the great shared joy we have so that when we are present again together, that joy will be made even more complete, even more sweet and wonderful. As we long to sing together, to study together, to welcome one another in a warm embrace yet again. Dinah First Baptist Church, I love you. And I pray that you will rest this week in the knowledge that God loves you perfectly. So to that end, would you mind if we pray together? Lord Jesus, you are King. You reign in not one not one virus is outside of your knowledge. So King Jesus, I pray that you would in your mercy grant us some means by which for this virus to be defeated. I pray that in your mercy you would would use this virus to remind us of the, the painful reality that 
pervasive power of sin in our lives and in our, in our world. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would, would grant much grace to those who are in Christ, that we would, would not walk through life with fear and dread as those who have no hope, but grant us hope that comes from a sure and certain future in glory with you. I pray where there is worry, where there is anxiety among your, your people, in the midst of, of our own congregation fellowship, grant us to find hope in the fact that that we have comfort in life and death, that we are not our own, but have been bought. And now rest in the arms of our King and our Savior. Holy Spirit, use us this week to bear witness to the glorious gospel of grace. Use us this week to love well that others might see the hope of Christ in us. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.